I, I think you all are probably aware of the reason we are here today. Uh, there has been a push from some within the legislature uh, to call a special session of the legislature. Um, and we are opposed to that. Um, we are opposed to that um, because COVID is raging across West Virginia right now. Uh, you all know the numbers. I, I don't need to share those with you. you. You cover them every day and you cover them well. Um, our hospitals are at or near capacity and people are literally dying across West Virginia. So this is a very serious situation, a very serious public health situation. And um, we do not believe that this is the time in the midst of this public health pandemic um, to call a special session to stop COVID mitigation efforts. Um, this is a time when we need to do, be doing everything we can uh, to corral support for public health and for our hospitals, um, our medical leaders who are trying to save us, uh, even save us from ourselves at some point. Um, so the question for us is, you know, who should, who should be leading us right now? And we think our, our medical, our public health professionals ought to be leading us right now. Uh, and if we were to open the can of worms, it would be a special session and allow politicians to lead during a pandemic, especially right now as things are so bad. Um, that, that's just a door uh, that we do not at all feel comfortable opening right now. Um, so I want to turn things over now to, to Ron Stallings, uh, a doctor and senator from Boone County. Doc? Steve, thank you. And very well said, I might add. Uh, just a little background. <clears throat> I'm not sure people understand that's not in the health uh, arena, just what's going on right now. I had a patient that had a four-wheeler accident that was sent to Lexington, Kentucky for trauma, for trauma care. He couldn't get into any place around here because of the uh, uh, excess of COVID patients and lack of uh, ER space, et cetera. Uh, I have a patient that was transferred from Boone Memorial Hospital. The only place they could go for an ICU bed was Dayton, Ohio. The ambulance service uh, was tied up that length of time transferring him from Madison, West Virginia to Dayton, Ohio. These are the normal stories now. One of my friends, colleagues at Boone Memorial said they sent a patient to Michigan. Now, uh, the folks uh, in other hospitals have, have texted me and said, what used to be an ER, or not an ER, but an operating room recovery room is now a makeshift intensive care unit with people on ventilators. And went on to say that, you know, not only uh, are these patients real sick, but the, they don't have adequate respiratory therapy uh, and adequate nursing, even though they're trying their best. So uh, we, this uh, uh, COVID uh, Delta variant is seven times more contagious than the original COVID-19. This variant is that much more contagious. Uh, and in fact, in social settings, when I'm talking to uh, public health people and infectious disease people, Basically, what they are saying to me is, you either are vaccinated or you will get this Delta variant. That's how contagious it is. Uh, and as we all know, and we've heard it again and again, uh, this is a pandemic right now of the unvaccinated. It's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Uh, if you remember back before we had the vaccine, uh, and, we, and I remember Clay Marsh talking about Look, we're gonna to have to do a little dance. That is, depending on how uh, uh, the community spread is, et cetera, we may have to close down things. We may have to uh, require masking and things like that. We're there, folks. We're there. It's, it, I think back then, I think it was like if it was 4% uh, positivity, it's 18% positivity. And so, Instead of putting obstacles and hurdles in front of our public health and health system in general, we should be supportive and listen to the experts. Uh, and this will not go away. This will not go away until we reach some type of herd immunity. And herd immunity, of course, is when either by getting the virus and developing your own immunity or by getting vaccines, vaccinated, 
you get up to 70 or 80 percent of the population vaccinated, and that protects the people that are not vaccinated. But we're just right around 50 percent. We're one of the least vaccinated states in the country, and therefore, not surprisingly, we have among the most uh, highest uh, infectivity rate or, or contagiousness. So uh, <clears throat> we're, we're in a pickle here, folks. And, and this thing about, you know, uh, going into special session and, and doing away with uh, well thought out uh, CDC guidelines, is, is, it's amazing to me we're even thinking about, it, to be honest with you. I'll leave it at there for now. I certainly, you know, entertain questions and, and may come back and even talk a little bit more. But I, I agree totally. We should not be uh, in a position uh, where we're in session and allowing folks that do not have medical knowledge or have medical knowledge and don't care. Uh, you know, that's a big deal. And again, we know. We know that kids need to be in school where they can learn, but we can't just, uh, you know, throw these kids out there who 12 and under can't be vaccinated without any type of protection. So we should be as fast as you could go get a vaccine, go get a vaccine to protect the people that cannot get a vaccine and that need to be in schools. You all know about the uh, child in Kentucky that they announced on the morning news had died. Uh, again, you know, these, this virus can be deadly. It might not be as deadly in kids, but it still can be deadly. Uh, and so, uh, you know, again, with, with the freedom that we have, uh, requires responsibility, responsibility to the people of West Virginia, the people that we love. Thank you, Doc. We appreciate you taking time to be away from your patients and be with us. Um, and yeah, we'll get to questions here in just a minute. Um, but first, I wanted to turn it over to Senator Richard Lindsay um, from Kanawha County. Um, Rich? Yeah, sure. I mean, the first thing I'll say is that uh, I guess back in the 2020 session, session, because of Doc Stallings' amendment, we were able to put money aside in the budget for COVID-19. So uh, it, you know, Doc's been on point from, on this issue from the very beginning. And to follow up with what he said, it is or it was unsettling to me to read or hear rumors about any type of special session that would effectively prohibit businesses, uh, school boards, state boards of education and or universities, any entities, prohibit them from protecting their customers or their employees or their students. It's irresponsible. Not only is it unsettling, but I believe it's irresponsible of any elected official to propose or suggest any type of legislation along those terms. Um, you know, I, I heard uh, Senator Baldwin say this morning, you know, it, it's almost as if that uh, the Democrats are taking a Republican position and letting businesses do what they should do to protect their employees and, 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 and customers. And yet there are fo the folks who, who are demanding a special session are Republicans. I don't know where that comes from and I don't understand it, but I, I just can't see why, why, why anyone would wanna do anything like that when in fact we should be supporting our hospitals, we should be supporting our healthcare providers. That's the legis, if you wanna call a special session, that's the way to do it. Um, so I, I, I think that, that you know, I stand with Senator Baldwin and, and Senator Stallings and, and the rest of our caucus and and telling the public that's where our caucus is. Um, and especially when you've got, I mean, we, Doc Songs was talking about a patient of his there in Boone, but it was in the paper just yesterday how Princeton Community Hospital and Mercer County, County they don't have beds for patients down there. So it's crushing our rural hospitals. I know here in Kanawha County, they're having significant issues with uh, staffing uh, shortages to take care of patients of all kinds. So we're not only talking about the patients who are unvaccinated and find themselves in hospitals and all the effects and impacts that has on, ha, has on the healthcare system, but patients down the line who need assistance, who need care, who don't have COVID but can't get it here in West Virginia because uh, folks are, are walking around and, and, are, and are given um, given the belief by some elected officials that they don't need to be vaccinated. 
uh, or misinformation about masks. And I think that again, you know, that that's not what that's not what we should do as leaders. To lead, sometimes you have to tell people that no, you need a vaccination, and yes, you have to wear a mask, and um, and it's not a constitutional right one way or the other that's been violated. Um, so I actually, I was thinking, you know, in response to, uh, you know, folks who are calling for this special session, potentially, you know, it reminded me of the greatest generation, how they're heralded, and they should be, our, our grandparents and our parents. They survived the Depression, they won a war, but they also accepted rationing of fuel and materials and, and food. They didn't stand out on a corner and, and demand a constitutional right to a full loaf of bread. And it's because we were all in this together and it was for the greater good. And, I, and again, I think if the population isn't there, it's an incumbent upon our, the elected officials, regardless of party, because COVID doesn't care if you're a Republican, independent, Democrat, regardless of party, we should all band together and do what's right for the public. And, and, and issuing statements suggesting a special session for legislation that would prohibit businesses, universities, and boards of education from, from taking care of their own is just the, the wrong direction. Thank you, Senator Lindsey. Um, I believe Brittany's sending out a message there to everyone asking um, um, if you'll seek recognition, if you have a question, and, and we'll move to that time now. So um, if folks have questions, please just uh, speak up and we'll do our best. It's like Brad's got the magical hand wave going there. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for making yourselves available. Um, as I read, I, I think maybe an unofficial list of delegates and senators who have asked for the special session, it, it doesn't really look like the number required to put it over the mark to actually make it happen. Uh, so I wonder about the briefing here today. Is it is it just to be on the record and, and get a counter message out that uh, some words of caution. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. The numbers are not there. Um, I, I can't speak to the House, but I can speak to the Senate. The numbers are not there in the Senate. And that means it's, it's bipartisan, you know, against this. Um, I think in terms of timing, um, I, I will just say that I think it's important. I felt it incumbent um, to speak up because COVID is raging right now. Um, you know, I'm afraid that people aren't taking this as seriously as they need to. Um, you know, my, my son started preschool today, so I'm a, I'm a ball of nerves <laughs> and so many other parents are. Um, I think it is incumbent upon us, as Senator Stallings said, as Senator Lindsay said, um, to all do our part to take responsibility to defeat COVID. And if we don't even see it as a threat or see it as an enemy or think there's anything that we can do about it, you know, if we just throw up our hands and say, you know, oh, well, uh, there's nothing we can do at this point, then I think we have failed in our duty. So um, the point of speaking out today is to take a stand and say, this is serious. People are in the hospital. They're in the ICU. They're on ventilators. They are dying. I mean, at our local task force meeting um, just the other day, our hospital pled with our community, said we have um, more COVID patients than we have had throughout the entire pandemic right now. Um, and right after we got off the call, two of those patients that were on vents died. Um, so this is affecting our state in drastic, dramatic ways. Um, and we wanted to take a stand to support those who are trying their best um, to save us. I might chime in also. It's important for the public, I think, to hear from people, uh, you know, with a scientific view. Uh, and because all, all I get are emails, uh, call a special session, uh, stop the mandate. Uh, you know, you don't hear from the general public, who I think is the silent majority, if you would, uh, that say, you know, gosh, I I can't wait to, you know, get my booster shot uh, or I can't wait until kids under 12 can get vaccinated. So I think uh, being, you know, when you see all the anti-vaxxing, anti-masking 
social media, then I think we need to answer that uh, in a in a real way. And I think that's another one of the reasons uh, we want to to do this and uh, get on record. Thank you, Brad. Phil, yeah, I see Phil Kabler's hand up. Oh, okay. Sorry, Phil. It, it's a little dark. I'm having. I don't see you very well. <laughs> yeah, I usually tilt my screen up back when the uh, governor would take my uh, questions during his briefing. I forgot to tilt it up for uh, ult uh, optimum uh, uh, viewability. Not not that there's much to see. Uh, I think one question is a lot of people have asked where have the uh, Democrats been during all this uh, uh, COVID surge? It, it seems like the you've been conspicuous in your silence. Uh, how do you respond to that? And also, uh, uh, do you have any uh, call for the governor to to take any uh, more proactive steps to uh, attempt to uh, uh, control the spread of the virus? I'll take, a first, I'll take a first stab at that. Uh, <clears throat> any public forum or any office forum that I am in, I, I certainly uh, talk about the serious nature of, uh, of this uh, huge uh, pandemic uh, getting worse by the day. Uh, and so, you know, every opportunity I've had, I was at the Racing Labor Day rally and and was on record there uh, talking about the necessity. And, and in fact, uh, in that group got a nice round of applause when I talked about uh, you know, the, the necessity and, and sometimes requirements for vaccines and requirements for masking and any other mitigation, uh, mitigation strategy. So, uh, you know, and, and when uh, you know, we received calls from uh, the other lead, the Republican leadership saying, my goodness, you guys got to stick together because, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of folks on the Republican side uh, that, uh, you know, it, it's a closer margin of error over there where uh, uh, several very important uh, people, very knowledgeable, want uh, us not to allow a special session. And so, you know, we, uh, I think we stepped up to the plate there and said, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're with the few Republicans uh, uh, so that we won't uh, get our, uh, whatever, three fifths majority in order to uh, call in a special session on the, from a legislative standpoint. So they, they could have counted on us and uh, we let them know we were pretty firm. Thank you, Doc. Uh, I would just say, Phil, in response to your question, uh, you know, where where have you been? <laughs> um, I found it very important, and I've I've placed a lot of stress on a local community response throughout the COVID pandemic. I lead a couple of local task task forces. Is that the proper plural usage? <laughs> uh, uh, task uh, two task forces, um, and that's a community collaboration effort. Um, I think that's where you can make a real impact. Um, and so, you know, we, we do that on a weekly basis. Um, we've also, I mean, we've taken proactive steps on a statewide uh, basis when it has been um, prudent and important to do so. Um, you know, I, I do not think it is helpful for politicians to step forward and beat their chests during a public health pandemic for political purposes. So, you know, you're, you're not seeing us doing that. And you're not, and that's one reason we don't want to see a special session happen, because that's what the content of it would be. You know, as, as Doc mentioned, we are receiving a significant amount of emails and phone calls, and Brittany can attest to this as well, um, from folks on a daily basis who feel very strongly about this. They think this is the right thing to do. Um, they think their, their freedoms and their rights are being infringed upon, and I appreciate them speaking up. But at some point, somebody has to be the adult in the room um, and stand up for what the right thing is, not just in the moment politically, but the right thing in terms of the health and well-being of the state. So in terms of the second part of your question about, you know, do we think more can be done? Absolutely. Um, 
to throw up our hands at this point and say, well, you know, the surge is upon us. It's just going to have to be that way. Um, I, I get some of that frustration um, because I think, you know, the executive level feels like they've done all they can and folks just um, aren't uh, taking the vaccine. Folks aren't wearing masks. But at the same time, um, there is always something you can do. You know, I, I've heard that from many people, including the governor himself. And um, I think there are absolutely things that we can do to mitigate COVID. And so that's why I agree with Senator Lindsey. We ought to be talking about things we can do to mitigate COVID, not calling a special session to get rid of tools to defeat COVID. Uh, I think we are just headed the opposite in the opposite direction as we should be. So just to follow up on, 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 on your question, I'll, I'll add to it. I mean, and, um, you know, Senator Baldwin is pretty humble as far as being out in front of the issue and, and, and taking a, a community approach. I mean, he puts out there pretty, pretty, uh, uh, he works with and puts out in the public what he does with the task force da down there in Greenbrier County and how he works with them and trying to figure out ways to address this issue. It may not get picked up, but it is happening. And I know that a few months ago that we, when we found out or heard or when it became public news that, for example, Tennessee was going to outlaw all vaccines, I'm pretty sure we sent out a press release that just never got picked up by anybody. So I think that, you know, we've attempted to go out there, but I think uh, here more recently, it's, it's just become, as Doc said, it becomes our responsibility to, to, to even be more forceful with it and make sure that the public knows that the facts about COVID and how to, you know, how to mitigate it. And again, just to just not step in the way of businesses and schools and universities who are trying to, all they're trying to do is protect their employees and their customers and their students. And I can't think of anything less worthwhile to do uh, or more hurtful rather than to suggest to the public we need a special session to prohibit them from doing that. When we've got, you know, 813 folks hospitalized, 250 on the, in ICU and 132 on life support and rural hospitals that don't have beds open and, and major, you know, hospitals like CAMC having a difficult time to keep up with their patient load. Um, so I think we've been out there. I think we put it out, out there to the public. I just don't think it's always been picked up. And right now, because we are in a health crisis as a state, it, it's getting more coverage and, and then it's our duty um, to, to respond and let the public know where we stand. And, and, and again, to, to what Doc said, to join the Republicans in the state Senate who don't want a special session either. Um, so the public knows it's bipartisan in that respect and that, and that we're, we're unified. Again, we have, you know, there are mitigation strategies that we reach a certain point. Well, we're past those points. So I think we really need to, uh, again, I wish the governor would listen to Clay Marsh more and the public health people more. Uh, we need to, you know, probably, uh, again, uh, require indoor masking, certainly for schools where kids are that can't be vaccinated. We need to, uh, again, if you look back at what they talked about back in January when we had our first big surge, there were mitigation strategies if you reach a certain uh, level or threshold. We need to use those. We're way past those. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's not, and, uh, again, it, this is everywhere. Doctors from Huntington, Dr. Chris Good, uh, who's the, you know, or, or he's up at WBU, but, uh, you know, the whole healthcare system is about to implode. And so, you know, the, the sense of crisis should be everywhere. You can't go into a hospital for an injury. You can't go into the hospital for a pneumonia or, or a non-COVID pneumonia or a heart attack. The access to care for people is, so we need to look at those things. Remember when we cut back on uh, elective procedures, we should have been there already. Uh, 
uh, requiring masks indoors, we should be there. We should restrict sizes, sizes of gatherings. We're past those points and we're not doing it yet. Okay, so uh, again, those are controversial things and I'm, I'm gonna be beaten up as I always am on public health issues. Uh, but we should be doing all those things that we talked about and said we should do back at the first surge. And we're not doing it. Brad, you have another question? Oh, I do. I don't want to hog them, but um, if nobody else is volunteering. Um, so my question is, this is over on the House side, but the majority leader in the House, Amy Summers, who is a nurse, explained today that her concern is that vaccine mandates among medical providers will drive away capable employees, uh, nurses where there's already a shortage. Some of them who are badly needed, she thinks this will be the tipping point and if they're required to take a vaccine, they'll leave. Um, you know, particularly I wonder from Senator Sollings's day-to-day -day point of view, if, if he's hearing those concerns, if he thinks that that concern is valid, and maybe if, if there ought to be some flexibility in what medical staff are asked to do, you know, could they uh, instead agree to put on even more personal protective equipment or uh, demonstrate that they've already had COVID-19 and, and provide their antibody report? Um, so anyway, I, I'm just wondering from, from another legislative and medical point of view. Thank you. So we... I just attended the West Virginia State Medical Association annual meeting. We had several uh, speakers regarding you know, vaccine hesitancy uh, and uh, approaches to uh, mitigating this uh, COVID and Delta surge. And uh, some 60 organizations, 60 organizations, so the hospital associations, the American Medical Association, Basically, they are all in lockstep together stating that there should be required vaccines. Now, you all know that there are certain medical exemptions, okay? I think that's, that's a little bit of flexibility. Uh, and then uh, if you're not vaccinated, uh, then, you know, frequent testing. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to quit nursing because you refuse to get a a vaccine, uh, that's, that's a tragic loss. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there are certain, a little bit of wiggle room, I think, as far as, as, far as a medical exemption standpoint uh, that you could talk about. But in general, I mean, these, uh, you know, the health care people, the people that know what's going on uh, are in lockstep together, 60 major organizations. Uh, so, I'm in that realm. I, I believe in science. I believe that uh, that's the way we ought to be going. Uh, we've had uh, a rare provider in our system uh, with COVID. Uh, they've, you know, they've they've uh, done all the things they're supposed to do and have quarantined and, and anybody around them. So, but that alone, I mean, if you want to look at what's going to take people away from delivering care, is if we don't get our arms around this. Uh, this uh, COVID uh, Delta variant huge surge because people are going to be out, uh, you know, uh, with COVID. People are going to be out uh, from quarantining from being exposed to someone. So I think you lose a bigger part of your workforce uh, if those uh, requirements are not there. Yeah. If I could jump in too, Brad, just because I, I think you raise a good point. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to listen to uh, Majority Leader Summers on the radio, but as I understand it, that's the point she made, what you just stated. And I would just respond with, I think hospitals, uh, there's already a nursing shortage, and there are a number of reasons for the nursing shortage. And I know that, I know for a fact, Senators Baldwin and, and, and Doc Stallings and I, I attempt with legislation every year to try to fix that, okay? Uh, but I, I will say this, I think the hospitals have decided that there's a greater risk of a nursing shortage if nurses can't go because they've got COVID. They can't provide care because they've got COVID. So, that, so that's, what, that's what the balance is. Now I have heard, and Brad, you may wanna check on this, okay? I don't know, because I don't live out in Huntington, but I have heard that Capital Huntington Hospital has decided 
that if a nurse refuses a vaccine, that they then have to be tested every other day or every week. They have to wear PPE. They have to social distance. They have to wear a mask. Now, I think the hospital should decide what they want to do. If they want to provide that alternative, fine. If they don't want to provide that alternative, fine. I'm not going to. The key is we should not be passing legislation and encode in statute a prohibition that doesn't take into, into consideration those particular alternatives that a hospital or business would want to employ. And, and that's the problem. That's where the rubber hits the road. And that's where I think the argument for a special session for legislation that would prohibit everyone from protecting patients, customers, and students, I think that that's just a bad idea and that's where it falls apart. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna stop Capital Huntington Hospital and I don't think legislation should stop Capital Huntington Hospital from providing that alternative. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not gonna stop CAMC or WVU Medicine from requiring uh, all, their, all their employees have be vaccinated. That's not our role. We shouldn't be doing it. Again, especially given the numbers of folks that are ill and on life support in ICU in our state. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Phil, for your all's questions. Did, did anyone else have any questions? Steve, okay. I have a question. I don't have a question, but uh, again, you know, I, I was around, I've got a scar on my arm. It's a smallpox vaccine. You know, that was in whatever, 1960 something. A hundred percent of the kids got a smallpox vaccine. We didn't ask uh, whether we could or not have it. We just got it. Same thing with polio vaccine. You know, it's just hard for me to understand uh, with the serious nature of COVID, what all the uh, anti-vax, anti-mask is. I mean, did the Freedom Caucus not exist back in, you know, 1962 or whatever, when I was seven years old? Uh, you know, it wasn't an issue. So I don't know what's happened in our society that uh, only 50% of Americans would, would be vaccinated uh, in, for, a, for a killer virus like COVID. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Brad, did I understand that you had a, a follow-up? Oh, yes. Tell me more about the majority asking you to take this position. Thanks. Some of us were, contact some of us were contacted by members of the majority that had grave concerns about what would happen if a special session was called. Hmm. And uh, they wanted to know where we were. They wanted to know what the, what the caucus numbers were. So that, uh, you know, again, we wouldn't have to be called in because there is certain fear of what would happen in a special session with a, with a super majority of Republicans and a significant uh, Freedom Caucus. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. It sounds like those were all the questions. So we appreciate your time and being on with us today. We hope you and your families stay safe. Uh, and we thank you for all you all do to try and get the word out there with you know um, information so people can um, know what's going on and make informed decisions. And um, I just want to thank you all for that. So thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Y'all have a good day.